All right, welcome back, everybody. This is Derek Kirby with the Dallas Prospect, and I am joined by Saad Youssef of The Athletic. And today we're going to be talking some Mavericks free agency and reflecting a little bit back on the draft as well as far as kind of an identity shift within the team. Saad, thanks for joining me today. How are you doing? I'm doing great, man. It's, uh, it's you know, it's unreal to think that camp is less than a week or so away now, about a week or less than a week away. Uh, players have to report by Sunday and uh, and the season is definitely less than a month away it is November 24th as we speak and December 22nd off we go yeah that's insane it feels like I just blinked and the season was ending so the idea that they're having to turn around so fast that's probably going to lead to a situation where you have I know the Lakers were kind of talking about it a little bit Jared Dudley referred to uh, the idea that like guys like LeBron might even sit out the first month of the season because they were hoping for January. I don't know if it'll come to that, but it wouldn't surprise me if you have a slow kind of startup for some of these guys really kind of finding their groove. Yeah, no, I, I, I think you're right. And also the, the thing to understand is, and, and yeah, the season is going to start December 22nd, but obviously by the time playoffs come around, it's going to be April, May ish. And what's going to be interesting with that is, if you're LeBron James, um, basically you're trying to get the eighth seed then because there's no home court advantage if it goes back to the bubble, right? So you don't even you don't even care uh, to to get a top four seed to get a number 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 one seed. But yeah. the interesting thing there is what if a vaccine does come around around March and April? You go into the season thinking, oh, it doesn't matter if I'm one through eight. Then all all of a sudden, uh, you you know your your road team uh, route so it's it's going to be an interesting dynamic because there is no home court advantage um you know if things go the way that they did last year which i think it's you know it's possible depending on how this pandemic kind of you know continues to trend yeah that's an that's an excellent point actually i hadn't even really thought of that that much that next year uh trending obviously in the bubble direction as well so yeah for someone like lebron who has kind of referred before to to turning it on late when he had to even though a couple of years ago they ended up not making the playoffs he talked about having to kind of turn it on the afterburners or something earlier than usual you know kind of picking it up late and if it if it is a bubble then yeah to your point it doesn't matter at that point if it's all a neutral court seating doesn't really matter especially if you're a team as talented as the lakers who the matchup doesn't entirely matter I mean you're still setting up a gauntlet potentially with that seating but they've got a a team deep enough certainly and I think they've improved this offseason as well so that's a really good point and that could be turned on its head if a if a vaccine does get introduced and everything I mean yeah it's hard to imagine though them turning from the bubble like if that's what they're working toward kind of shifting towards like right before the playoffs would be scheduled to start like, Oh, never mind. We are going to stay at our respective courts. Uh, you know, you say that and I, and I'm with you, but man, money speaks so much louder than anything we're saying right now. And if you, and if they have the opportunity to host in those stadiums and get all that uh, concession money, get all the, get all the tickets and, and the crowd and, and all that to go along with their TV money, um, I bet you they would strongly consider doing something like that in addition to saving all the money that you save from not having to put on a bubble. Um, I think the financial stuff would be very enticing if it is that situation. But again, you know, it's hard to determine what's going to happen in three weeks, let alone three, four months. So for sure. And they could always just kind of go the route sort of like uh, the NFL in the case of like the Cowboys with like 20 or 25% capacity even and still be right saving money rather making money at that uh, at that rate so that's a that's true as well but the Mavericks uh, have had kind of an interesting approach to the offseason it seemed like they were linked to in some way or another every big name middle name uh, imaginable under the sun and what I what I feel is that they kind of made a, a concerted effort for like a philosophical shift you know we we talked about how efficient this offense was last year, historically efficient. And, you know, health, yeah, you had like 10 and 15 games, I think, missed respectively between Luka and KP. That's an approximation. I don't remember the exact number. But health was an issue, but you still wound up, despite the historically good offense, with a seven seed and a first-round exit. And so it seems like there might be a philosophical shift here where they're basically saying, you know what, 
we're willing to, at least in the short term, surrender a little bit on that offensive efficiency side, potentially, as long as we got Luca running the show and we're going to just try and surround him with as many perimeter defenders and athletes as we can. And I think they actually pulled off a really nice haul. Like they really did their homework, I thought, on the draft and let it come to them. Yeah, no, they absolutely did. And I think a lot of what you're saying is, is you know, right on point. I think what's, what's interesting to see here is the Mavericks overachieved by, by all standards last year. Um, you know, even though it was, you know, a seventh, seventh seed, um, seventh seed and first round exit, which, you know, was for a lot of people was the expectation. It's important to remember they had a very large cushion on the eighth seed. So they were, they were more in the, in the three or four, four through seven range than they mm -hmm. were seven and eight. So, you know, they were closer to being a top four seed than they were to being on the bubble of the playoffs. That's one thing. And the second thing, they drew the worst matchup possible for them in the playoffs, right? So, um, you know, and then e even when they drew that terrible matchup, they were still in every single game. And it took KP being unavailable through ejection and injury for them to really go down. And they still took it to six. So, you know, they overachieved. Now, the two biggest blemishes on their on their season last year, one was late game offense, which, you know, that is something that is is fixable, it's correctable. It one, it comes through experience. Two, it, we saw Luca in his rookie year be really good in late in games. So you know it's there. They just need to fix the things. But the second thing, and this comes back to your point. They played 26 games last year in which they scored fewer than 110 points. They were seven and nine those games. That's not – you, you got to be better than that when you're scoring less than 110 because you, you can't count on your offense to go score 110 or, or more every single time they go out on the court. So, yes, um, absolutely you're right. Like, you know, I think, you know, all, the, all these things factor in and, and how they want to build the identity. And the biggest thing in, in, this, in all of this is still Luka Doncic because what the Mavericks are basically saying is that if, you, if Luka is here, we are confident that, yeah, Seth Curry is probably the best shooter um, in the league right now and, and statistically um, one of, if not the best shooters in league history. But what the Mavericks are also saying with this is that, you know, as long as we have, as long as we have decent shooters, we'll be okay. So last year, Seth Curry, Maxi Kleba, Tim Hardaway Jr., Dorian Finney-Smith, all four of those guys had career best three-point shooting percentages as they played with the season Luka. And so what the Mavericks are saying, as long as you're not a terrible, terrible three-point shooter and just can't shoot, um, Luca's going to create enough good looks for if you are a true 36% shooter, you'll probably end up making 39% anyways, just because your looks are going to be so good. Yeah, absolutely. And yeah, that, uh, I had actually forgotten that stat you mentioned the, the seven and 19 in games where they scored less than 110. That is striking for sure. Cause I think everyone saw that, you know, they were like 31st or something in the league in terms of final three minutes, offense, clutch time, offense, um, but I, I think that will round into form. Like you said, Luca was much better in the clutch as a rookie. So maybe it was just a, a weird thing last year, but I, I think they'll trend in that proper direction there. Uh, yeah. Seth second all time career three point percentage with at least a thousand attempts behind only Steve Kerr. Um, Kerr was like 45, two or something Seth is 44 or something. I think 44, eight, but uh, it's, yeah, you lose a guy like that. It's going to hurt. But I do think that as much as, we love Seth Curry and, and I was a huge Steph, uh, sorry, Seth Curry fan. Uh, even his first swim through Dallas, like that was, that was one of my favorite guys to watch in recent years. And I was happy when they brought him back. I was thrilled. And you saw the value at times this year that he really could add, but he's still a guy that is a little bit more, I think one dimensional than they wanted. And they saw an opportunity to make an improvement there where you know, there, I think Tim Cato's article talked about a deal they had where they could have brought in Covington from Houston, but uh, Houston wanted 18 and 31 for Covington. And instead you send out Seth and pick up pick 36 as well. And you don't lose those other picks. And so now instead of getting one substantially good piece, 
for that kind of role of what you're wanting, you're able to get a still very good piece in Josh Richardson, a guy who is that versatile uh, guard perimeter defender there. And he was better offensively than I thought when I, when I, I mean, I looked back at like Miami the year before and he was like 16 and four almost as far as his average. So he adds more on that side than I was aware at the time the deal went down, but you had a guy like that. And then with your picks, you get, you know, Josh green, uh, 36, you get Tyler Bay. So you're able to get a lot and including uh, Tyrell Terry, who, you know, he might be obviously a rookie, but you're still getting probably one of the best sharpshooters in the draft and a guy that's going to sort of step into that Seth Curry role with time, I think. So I think they did a wonderful job actually managing and navigating a very difficult situation, even though, again, it's, it's not flashy moves that like casual fans will necessarily notice but I think it's moves that make the team decidedly better by addressing their greatest weakness. Like if you already had the most efficient offense in league history, you can only go so much further with that most likely, unless you're able to bring in like a crazy, crazy big name or something. And so I think this shift saying, Hey, we were 18th overall in defense. That's not going to cut it. We have to get better on that. end so that we don't have to score more than 110 points every single game, just to be able to be, you know, win the game or even just be in it really then I think that shows like a, a drastic shift in mindset and Luca being Luca with the vision that he has and passing ability, he's going to find those guys and you'll get better spot up opportunity looks for them that allow them to have those career best years. So it's, yeah, it's, it's really interesting to see how it feels like they sort of skated in under the radar and yet made several moves that make a lot of sense in the current picture and long-term even. Yeah. And, and, you know, to go back out, uh, about, you know, it kind of being under the radar and you, knowing that, okay, you have to make a move because it, it doesn't matter how good your offense is if your defense uh, doesn't measure up. If you think about it, this is very similar to their offseason approach last year when, ironically, it, 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 it involved bringing Seth in. Because remember, their rookie year, Luca was ahead of schedule. They're like, okay, Luca's great. And these passes he's making are great, but what good does it do if he's making all these amazing passes and no one is there to knock down the shots? Mm -hmm. And so then they're like, okay, we need to bring this under the radar move. We're going to bring in Seth Curry. So all of a sudden this under the radar move, whereas, you know, you're talking about the whole offense at last year, it was more about Luca. We maxed out about how good he is and it doesn't do us any good him being that good. If he doesn't have other pieces around him. Now, this year, it's the same concept, but a bigger picture. It doesn't do us any good if our offense as a whole is this good, if our, if our defense is just leaking continuously. And so then, ironically, it meant sit, shipping Seth out and bringing in Josh Richardson, who, by the way, we keep saying, because, because he is, you know, an upgrade defensively and the defense was such a concern, we keep talking about his defense. But as you very aptly pointed out, his offense is not a joke either. He is a good offensive player. Um, is he Seth Curry? No. I mean, he's not Seth Curry, but, but he's not too far below that. And, um, you know, when, you, when you're talking about, you know, if, if, if you were preparing for a three-point shooting contest, you downgraded big time. But if you're preparing to win NBA games, there's a plus-minus percentage. How much, how much worse did you get offensively compared to how much better – did you get defensively? And I think the maps come out favorably on that side of the equation in the Josh Richardson for Seth Curry swap. And that is just considering this season. Um, as you said, Tyrell Terry is a guy that long-term can, can maybe, you know, fall into the role of Seth Curry. And again, when you're, when you're talking about a second round pick, you're, you're not, I, I think it's unfair to Tyrell Terry to say, you know, you expect him to become the second best shooter in NBA history. Sure. But, but the point is you're, that the role is the point. You hope that he can become a sharp shooter who's there to knock down shots when he's wide open, when he's open, and play some level of maybe some underrated defense uh, that, that he can, you know, just disrupt some guards on the other team. That's all you're looking for from there. But at the end of the day, you know, are you better with Josh Green – Tyrell Terry, Josh Richardson, and Tyler Bay compared to Seth Curry and Robert Covington? Absolutely. I mean, you know, the Mavericks made the right move. 
Yeah, a hundred, hundred percent. I agree with that. And, you know, I, I like even another savvy move they made. They might not have had like a big splash trade. Uh, I know we obviously the Curry trade was uh, a significant move for them, but the other move they make, they're able to flip DeLon Wright and Justin Jackson for James Johnson. So I think with that, you know, everyone kind of talks about how, oh, well, they've got their enforcer now, their bodyguard for Luca. So if you do have a Marcus Morris situation develop, you've now got someone who is going to, uh, who's going to have his guys back and you don't have to send KP in there. And then KP is ejected from a playoff game just for standing up for Luca. So that's, that's good. It's great to have a guy like that, but that's another guy as well, who I think is an underrated acquisition. He, he, I mean, looking back at his highlights as well, I know obviously he was also in Miami a couple of years ago with Richardson, but looking back even at just his play last year, like there's more to his game than I thought. He's got more range than I thought uh, that he was going to have. And if he's in your second unit, I think that's a really good big to bring in. And it addresses another problem. As we talked about, this team also needed a little bit of help with the front court between Dwight Powell coming back off and Achilles. And, um, you know, you don't want to play Boban heavy minutes, and so I think they were able to kind of navigate that and shore up what was a thinner uh, lineup kind of for them previously. Yeah, I agree with that. And all, but, but also, you know, if everything pans out for their big men and say James Johnson is not a big part of the role because say best case scenario everywhere happens, right? Which is not going to happen. That's not how the NBA works. That's not how sports work. Injuries happen, things happen. Um, but say best case scenario, KP, healthy all season once he comes back. Dwight Powell goes back to his previous form. Again, they brought back Willie Cauley-Stein on a, on a one-and-one, basically. It's a two-year deal, but with the team option on the second, on the second year. Say he's, he, you know, he was, he was lethal in the pick and roll in his very limited role last year. Say he's fantastic. Say Maxi Kleba is everything that you want him to be as a backup big man. Well, it's still a major upgrade um, to your to your future because you got rid of DeLon Wright, who had two years left on his contract, for James Johnson, who is on an expiring deal. So James Johnson, yes, he can bring value as the enforcer. Yes, he can bring value as a defender and as someone who can maybe put a few uh, basketballs in the bucket. But at the end of the day, his greatest value – now, I'm not, I'm not saying he's going to be a scrub on the court. Again, he's – I think he's like 32, 33 or something. So he's up there, Yeah. but it, he has so many, there are so many different avenues to which this could be a success for the Mavericks, whether it be his play on the court, whether it be his, uh, his vibe and Luca defending, um, you know, in scrappiness and, and I don't want to say off the court, but um, outside of the whistles um, or just his salary situation Either way, this is an upgrade in some situation because having DeLon Wright's salary on the books in the 2021 offseason would have really sucked. And, and you know, maybe we're going to get to this a little later, but since I already brought up his name, Willie Cauley-Stein, same thing. You know, you, you like to have a big while you don't know what the situation with Dwight Powell is going to be. Um, Dwight Powell's main role was a pick and roll guy. Well, that's what Willie Cauley-Stein is as well. So you have a insurance there for Dwight Powell if he doesn't come back but you also uh, have a team option on the second year so you can if you want to go for the big and look I don't think it's going to be Giannis but there's other big fish out there except for uh, other than Giannis and you still have so much flexibility in the 2021 offseason. Yeah for sure and and Johnson's contract definitely helps that I think he's got like 16 million uh, on the books there and so between his contracts um, falling off one. That's a, a good trade chip. Just having that kind of that contract size makes it easier to make some of these numbers work if they do end up moving on that. Because while the Mavericks haven't really been a great free agency team, they are good at swinging deals. Generally, it seems like whether it's for better or worse, you know, and so between that and Tim Hardaway Jr. opting into his deal, you have two sizable contracts that are expiring that always is going to keep that door open as well for any kind of midseason thing. I'm not saying that's what they're going to do, but it's good to have that flexibility and that um, opportunity if you need to call on it for any reason. If, if something opens up, right, like uh, the KP thing kind of falling into our lap like it did a couple of years ago, uh, that guy being available, there's no way you plan on that, even though they had been kind of calling and checking in every so often for a year or two prior. 
on the KP availability. If something like that comes along, then you have the pieces now that you can move. Whereas before you didn't really have other than like the Hardaway thing with his player option, you didn't have as much flexibility there. So I feel like that works well and it does open up that max salary slot now for 2021, as you referenced. And it's, it's one of those things too. It's like, as map fans, I think we're a little jilted just by the belief of like, Oh, well, we're, we're so enamored with the big fish that we focus on that. And we don't always take into consideration quality moves that we do make. If it's not the big fish or at least someone in that secondary tier, it you'll have fans who kind of feel like we're, we're swinging and missing or, we're, we're not doing enough to keep Luca happy and keep him here or something like that. As long as the team's improving, that's, that's the main focus. And I think what they've done here really gives them opportunity. And that's, that's better because this off season with the 9.6 mid-level exception, I believe is what the value was. They didn't really have flexibility unless they were able to swing some kind of significant deal and Hardaway not opting in until the day after the draft, you know, basically going right up until that deadline I think kind of limited anything they could do on that front, even though they do like Hardaway and have talked about wanting to keep him. So now you've got that flexibility. And even though you were only really able to bring in back Willie Cauley Stein on that deal. Now it still is a smart enough move to your point that keeps that door open now for insurance now and a lot of possibility in the upcoming summer. Yeah, and I know math fans are, you know, uh, you, you, you kind of roll your eyes or groan anytime you hear cap space. But, but here's the thing. This is the first time they're having cap space with this kind of a player, with Luka Doncic. Marc Gasol uh, reportedly, I, I, it was Tim Cato that reported it, that he seriously considered um, coming to Dallas and end up going with the Lakers. Um, but but with Luca, it's different. It's different for a few reasons um, than what we're accustomed to. One, the cap space in, in the past was with an aging Dirk. Um, mm-hmm. So and, and so that's one thing. Secondly, and trust me, I grew up on Dirk. There's, there's few bigger Dirk fans than than than, I, than myself. But Dirk's position is a disadvantage because you know, a, as a power forward type guy. It's completely different than wanting to play with a point guard slash point forward, which is what Luca is. Wanting to play with Luca is like wanting to play with LeBron, right? Like mm-hmm. that's the kind of um, and Luca makes you better, and so and so those are the kind of things that look maybe maybe it all falls flat and the, the mass fall flat on their face in 2021. If they do then it's a learning experience that, okay, maybe it's just something about this Jersey, something about this city that players just don't want to come here, but you don't know that until you don't try it with this player, because this Luka, Luka Doncic is a, is a, is a different player. This is a different situation than Dirk. Um, It always has been, I mean, Dirk took about three, four years to really find his footing in the NBA Luca took about three minutes to find his footing in the NBA. Mm-hmm. Um, teams are already in Amber, and I remember Luca's rookie year. Um, see, I covered Dennis Smith Jr.'s l- rookie year when he when he went at Draymond Green, and Draymond Green after the game basically just kind of rolled his eyes, snickered, and was like, "Hey, this isn't this is an NC State. This isn't the G League. You better watch what you're doing." He said that for Dennis Smith Jr. Then when Luca, Luca's rookie year, Draymond Green was like, this guy is already a problem in the NBA. And Draymond couldn't stop talking good things about him. Players recognize what Luka Doncic is. You have to have cap room available to give yourself a chance. Um, I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know if they're going to be able to land anything. History says the Mavs always, always, always acquire talent via trade. Mm -hmm. Uh, That's how they acquired Jason Terry. Uh, Jason Kidd the second time around. Heck, Dirk Nowitzki on draft day, Luca on draft day, Tim Hardaway Jr., all these guys, KP, all these guys are, are, are trade acquisitions, but this is a different kind of superstar. This is a different kind of player. I can't wait to see what kind of pull he has in free agency because it has the potential to be a pretty big one. Yeah, for sure. And, you know, it, it's going to be interesting as well to see – Obviously, health is going to be a big thing, right, for KP. 
we we felt a little better, I think, to some extent going into this offseason because we had had a full year of seeing Luca and KP. So you see Luca's historically good sophomore year where in which he's, I think, a top five MVP finalist. You see KP from January until his meniscus tear in the, I think it was in the first game of the playoffs, but he played the second game as well, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, or maybe it was at the start of the second game. But regardless, from January through the eventual end of his season, he he largely looked like the KP of old. And a lot of that came with his, you know, it's, you don't want to point to saying like, oh, well, when Dwight Powell got hurt, that's when KP stepped up. It's, but there was something to be said. Once you moved KP from the four to the five, he seemed more aggressive and he seemed like his, his impact was more noticeable. He seemed less like a decoy and more like an actual uh, threat on the offensive side. Well, and it's a bigger mismatch there. That's the biggest thing. It's true. A bigger mismatch um, at the center position. Um, he is the unicorn. He is unique, but um, he's, he's even more unique as a center um, than as a power forward. You have guys that play power forward in the league that can take you off the dribble and do some of those things very few centers are, are able to do that. You have the Anthony Davises of the world and maybe a couple more, but the stuff KP does matched up as a five is completely different compared to as a four. So that's one of the biggest things. So is there something there that you think that Dallas is going to keep him in that role? And if so, is there any greater risk as far as his health, his knees and all of that? playing the five versus the four, just given what those positions are asked to do in Carlisle's system. Yeah, no, and, and this, I, I do want to preface by saying this is my, uh, this is my speculation. I'm not reporting this. Sure. Um, but, but I think it's one thing that I'm going to be very intrigued to see is do the Mavericks play two different styles of basketball? And, and, you know, maybe that is something that, you know, can catch teams off guard and things like that, because now, you know, do the Mavericks play a pick and roll, uh, hit the rim, crash the rim type ball when Dwight Powell and Willie Cauley Stein are in? And then do they play a different kind of ball where it's five out, space out, um, everything when KP or Maxi Kleber are in? See, so they have two guys for each brand of basketball. Willie Cauley Stein and Dwight Powell don't have an outside game. So you have to play pick and roll. You have to play inside. You can't play five out offense with them, right? But KP is the ultimate five out big man. But Maxi Kleba is a poor man's KP. And so he's a lot of the same skill sets, just not as good, just not as talented. But his skill sets are the same and he's not bad. So you have the potential here to basically play two completely different styles of basketball within the same basketball game, within the same 48 minutes, you can play two different styles. That's going to be something that's going to be very interesting to me um, at, at how Rick Carlisle balances this because uh, for lack, for just a comparison, I don't know how many of the listeners here are NFL NBA crossover, but look, when Drew Brees is in the game, you have one style. Drew Brees comes out and Taysom Hill comes in the game. You're, you're playing a whole different offense. There's a whole different thing that you have at your disposal uh, disposal as an offense. Um, mm -hmm. Now, Drew Brees and Taysom Hill is probably a 90 to 10 ratio. Maybe the Mavericks go 70-30, you know, with the yeah. KP Maxi being 70. But 30% of the time, you're running pick and roll. And you have guys in Jalen Brunson. And, and, uh, and, 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 hey, they brought Trey Burke back. You have guys that can play the pick and roll. And Luka can just do everything. So you can have him in, cross over in both situations. Um, so there's just a lot of possibilities here. And, and I'm really interested to see how Carlisle, who I believe is a, is a top three coach in the NBA, can, can work with that. For sure. And having a guy like KP who just demonstrated that he can do both of those, you obviously for his health, you want to try and protect him a little bit from having to do the rim running as much, but he has shown that uh, he can be extremely proficient in that as well. So that's just another thing that can kind of keep um, opposing teams off balance just a little bit. Like you assume when he's out there that it would be the five out thing like you were talking about, but then he can also still attack the basket and do a little bit of that here and there as well. Yeah, it's uh, it's very interesting to see how they're going to kind of adjust with the new personnel because there are a lot of new guys coming in. Um, and 
I think that they're still going to be one of the best offenses. I don't, I don't know if it'll be anything like last year's quote unquote uh, most efficient offense in history, but anytime you have Luca running the show and if you do have a he- a healthy KP for the majority, if not the entirety of the season, you're still going to be, I think a very proficient offense. It's just, I want to see what their, what their identity kind of looks like in that regard. Um, yeah. The, if they got guys like Willie Cauley Stein and Dwight Powell running the pick and roll, it'll probably look a little bit like the start of last year before Dwight's injury. And it felt like even though KP excelled in that role, there was just a little bit not because Dwight Powell is so good, obviously in the pick and roll, right. And finishing around the rim, the lob threat he presents. And I think Steve Kerr even kind of referenced that at one point in the season when they played Dallas was when you had that dimension as well to it, you really had to guard everything and it was incredibly difficult to do, but with that removed, it made it just a little bit easier to, to plan against. So it'll be very intriguing to see how they balance that, whether it's the personnel or the, just the health situation with some of these guys still having question marks by their name in that regard. Yeah. And two, two quick things um, to build on your point is one, they do need to manage KP's minutes per game and games per season, because that body type seven foot, whatever is not built to play the style of game that he does for the rigor of an entire regular season and an entire playoff run. They need to make sure he's ready for an entire playoff run, even if that means mixing things up during the regular season. And then secondly, uh, to your point about, you know, if they revert back to last year and things like that, the biggest difference, though, is if they revert back to last year with their Dwight Powell um, and Willie Cauley-Stein pick-and-roll offense – they, there's a lot more clarity and surety now about what you want to do with KP. KP last year was not only were they did they have a healthy Dwight Powell in playing that offense, KP was trying to figure out two things. He was trying to figure out how he fits in Rick Carlisle's system, and he was trying to figure out that for the first time in his life, he, remember this guy was a top lottery pick, one of the best players on every – he's probably been the alpha on every team that he's played on, He's trying to figure out how to be the number two option for the first time in his career. Those two factors are done. We saw KP has figured out his fit in Carlisle's system. Mm -hmm. KP has figured out how to play next to Luka. So even if they go back to some of the things from last year, there's just more clarity about how to approach it now and have a seamless transition. Yeah, for sure. And uh, you made the point as well about having to rest him in terms of his number of games with this season being condensed like it is, there is, I I don't know how many of these back-to-backs there are going to be. I haven't looked at the exact schedule, um, but I I did hear that they were going to be more back-to-backs and even a situation where you might have like three games in four days or something to that effect. And if that's the case, you've got to think KP's missing. Certainly if you got three games in four days, he's missing one, if not two, um, just depending on how that schedule matches up and what those opponents are. But yeah, you have to be, I think, extra cautious with him. You saw early on last year, they tried to be very cautious with him. And then they kind of let him get a little more active for a while. And then he had the initial setback with his knee, uh, where it was the tendonitis. And then he missed about 10 games, I want to say. And then when when he came back from that, he even had the setback as well with that, where he was a green light to go and then in shoot around or something right before the game. Uh, something didn't feel right and he missed a couple more games but when he did come back finally that's when he went on the tear that pretty much went until he tore his meniscus in his right knee not the ACL from the left knee um, at that point so I think Dallas is going to have to continue kind of trying to manage him as best they can because even though he was on a tear from January on I think at times they might have been tempted to let his minutes and his usage kind of creep up a little bit more just because you see like what he's doing um and the and the tear he can go on whether we're talking about it was it was in the bubble play I'm trying to remember I think it was the Portland game he had like five threes in the first quarter or something like that when he's just going off it's tempting to just kind of keep feeding him and keep trying to ride that out and that's how you have a game where he had like huge points in the first quarter like nothing in the second quarter huge points in the third quarter and then didn't score again until like four minutes left in the game in the fourth quarter where it's just a little uneven as they try to figure that out you know yeah absolutely and I, and you know in the bubble he was probably the best player uh that the Mavericks uh that, that the Mavericks had 
in terms of production. Now, Luca is always going to be the primary. He's always going to be orchestrating the show. But Kristaps Porzingis was probably the most productive player in terms of output that the Mavericks had uh, in that time. And, and, you know, last year, before the pandemic, I used to do uh, film breakdowns with, uh, with the Texas Legends coach who, who, you know, runs meets with the Mavericks coaches and, and runs the same system in their G League affiliate. And one thing that he told me while, when we sat down once, he said, Luca, make no mistake about it, is going to be the cornerstone, the guy for the next 10 years. But this doesn't work. This whole operation does not work if Christos Porzingis is, one, not there, and two, not effective. So a lot of this hinges on Christos Porzingis. And, uh, and we saw that, you know, like you said, uh, in the bubble. But we also saw it before the bubble. Um, remember, Christos was working his way back for the first couple months, mm-hmm. right? Then right around mid-December, he starts looking pretty good. That's when Luca sprained his ankle for the first time. Luca comes back, and then KP has the injury on New Year's Eve in Oklahoma City. Then KP is out for 10 games. He comes back, and, that, and then after that first game, that first game, Dwight Powell gets hurt. And then in practice right after that, Luca gets hurt. Yeah. And then Luca comes back right before the All-Star break, and, and there's only two, three weeks before the pandemic brings a halt to everything. So in those two, three weeks, they look great. In the bubble, they look great. So we know that, you know, they, they have figured it out. And KP is going to be very vital in everything. Yeah, absolutely. And that's a great point as well that uh, certainly it's easy to forget how those injuries all just stacked up one after another after another and how it just continually disrupted the entire rhythm and everything of the team. And that's why I, I guess to that effect, you know, we talked about them being a seven seed last year. If you didn't have such an up and down health situation with those two guys kind of trading off or the Dwight Powell injury, you probably are to your point earlier uh, in that closer to that three to five range there. Certainly those, the records from two to seven last year were very condensed. So yeah, it's, it's intriguing to see what this team can be. And I mean, that's, that's even without, uh, a, a big fish or anything to that effect whether they're able to do that we'll see but even if they don't I do think they are set up for the long haul very well they they have only two players now well they're bringing back JJ right so with that being the case then I think they have three guys now who are 30 or above that being Johnson Boban and JJ but other than that they're a considerably young team like Richardson's only what like 26 I want to say yeah, I think he's somewhere around there. Yeah, so yeah, they're they're a they're a young but not an inexperienced young team, and I think that bodes well. And you've surrounded Luca with I think enough guys that can fill the role reasonably well of three and D. That with his vision and passing, you can get more out of them than they would do elsewhere. You know that's why, and I think Tim Cato has done a good job pointing this out in some of his articles as well. Uh, you almost have to look the next level like okay well what's this guy's catch and shoot percentage on three not just like what did he shoot from three last year because that's almost the the next level stat that matters most with Luca because he'll find you he'll find you and he'll get more out of you than um than those guys would get with their previous teams and so it's just a different different animal essentially to compare but it should be a lot of fun to see what this team does I know we said how some Maverick fans are almost frustrated feeling like we didn't do anything big but the analogy I kind of used uh, in talking with some of them was like, you know, it's not like you threw made big waves by just throwing one big rock into a pond or something. It's kind of like you just threw a bunch of small rocks, but the collective uh, wave is still bigger than if you had done just the one. The team made a lot of not so much splashy moves, but savvy moves that made the roster far improved, I think, over last year. Certainly not as one dimensional and I think that's going to serve them very, very well moving forward. Yeah, I agree. And it's important to remember the, the Mavericks are climbing the stairs. They're not zip lining. So they're not trying to go from for, they're not trying to get from point A to point B overnight real quick. They're climbing the steps. And um, they were a seven seed last year with a first round exit. Getting to the second round or conference championships would be 
uh, probably the goal. The, I mean, look, the players and, and ownership and front office and coaches will tell you, of course, the goal is to win a championship. That's the goal every year. But the, really, when you look at the cap space for 2021 and the way this thing is progressing, um, starting in 2021 and extending for probably a solid eight years, if not the next decade, 2021 to 2029 to 2031 is the championship window. Next year, you, you look, if, if you win a championship, that's great. And I'm not putting it past them because I'm, I'm, I'm done putting limits on what Luca can do. But if, he, if, if he's able to elevate, elevate his game to astronomical levels again, sure, they can win a championship. But if they get to the second or third round, that's great. That's the next step. 2021, though, it's championship or bust every year. And that's going to be fun to watch. And they're going to be set up for that talent-wise as well. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you for joining me here on this. It's always, uh, always great to talk Mavericks basketball and to speak with someone like yourself. Uh, very much enjoy your work with The Athletic. And even listening, uh, whether you've been on ESPN or now with The Ticket, always enjoy your work. Appreciate it, man. Always a pleasure to be on with you. Thank you. If you guys like this video, don't forget to drop a like, leave a comment below, subscribe to the Dallas Prospect. And until next time, remember, every legend was once a prospect. Peace.